Abraham has just been entertaining heavenly visitors in chapter 18. He knows that the wickedness in Sodom and Gomorrah is uh, wickedness of an extreme kind and an absolute kind. He knows that these visitors possess a righteousness of an extreme kind and an absolute kind. And he knows that when their righteousness encounter the wickedness in those cities, there's going to be a great explosion. There's going to be a great conflict. And he knows that these three visitors from heaven are going to win. And he knows that the people who live in that city, those cities, are going to lose. Now here's the problem. Abraham has family down there. He's got family down there. And he can't imagine that it's going to be good for his family when these men bring the judgment of God on those cities. In chapter 14, Abram rescued Lot and his family by, by war. In chapter 18, Abraham rescues Lot and his family by prayer. And what we have in many ways is an example of the first real prayer, at least the first extended prayer in the Bible. We have that in Genesis 18 as Abraham walks with one of the heavenly visitors and he, he essentially he prays to him. And the prayer is like a bargaining encounter in a Mideastern market. If you go into the Mideastern market, the price is set. Let's say the, the price is 500 rubles. And you say, well, I only have 490 rubles. You're not going to let this deal go away because of only 10 rubles, are you? Um, and then the bargaining begins. And that's the, that's the way the, the dialogue proceeds at the end of chapter 18. Abraham asked the question, will you, in verse 23, are you going to sweep the righteous away with the wicked? In other words, are you going to blow up everyone in those cities even if some people in, those, in that city is righteous? And Abraham says in verse 24, what if there are 50 righteous people in the city? Are you going to sweep it away? Wouldn't you spare the cities if there were 50 righteous people there? You wouldn't do such a thing to slay the righteous with the wicked. Now, Abraham asks a question in verse 25 which is a question that all of us need to ask when we face a situation when it seems that God is not fair or where it seems that God is punishing the innocent or where it seems that the righteous are really suffering and we ask the question, how could God, how could God possibly allow this or how could God possibly do this? Abraham asks a question deep in the Old Testament, deep in the book of Genesis. Genesis 18, 25, and this is the question. Shall not the judge of all the earth deal justly? In other words, if God is the judge of the whole earth, won't he do the right thing? Won't he do the right thing? And the answer to that question has to be yes. If we don't think the answer to that question is yes, then we don't have a good reason to worship God, do we? We also trust his judgment above our own judgment. So the Lord says in verse 26, you know what? If there are 50 righteous in that city, you don't have anything to worry about. I'll spare the whole place because of those 50. Now the bargaining begins. Abraham says in verse 28, well, well what if there is almost 50 but not quite 50? Suppose there are 50 are lacking five. In other words, 
What if, there's, what if there are only 45 righteous people but not 50 people? Are you going to destroy a whole city just because of those five who aren't there? And the Lord says in verse 28, I will not destroy it if I find 45 there. Abraham speaks to him again in verse 29, well, what, what about 40? And he says, I'll not destroy it if there are 40 there. Then he gets him down to 30 in verse 30. And in verse, see, he was going in increments of five. Now he's going in increments of ten. He thinks he's got an advantage with God, so he pushes it, and he keeps praying. Then he says, what if there are twenty are found there? And God says, I won't destroy it if there are just twenty people there. And then he says, what if there are only ten people there? What if there are only ten righteous people there? And God says, I will not destroy it on the account of the ten. Now here the prayer stops. And here the dialogue stops. And I've heard, I heard one great preacher, maybe one of the best preachers in the United States, say, give a reason one time about why the dialogue stopped, and I did not agree with the reason. Um, he said that the dialogue stopped because Abraham realized that there were not ten righteous people in the city, and he realized that only Christ is righteous. I don't think that has anything to do with why he stopped. That's a classic case of dragging the New Testament back into the Old Testament. First of all, Abraham is not the one who stopped the conversation. God is the one who stopped the conversation. Because it said that God finished speaking to Abraham and departed and went on his way. But I also think that Abraham was confident that there were ten righteous people in that city. But he was wrong. There wasn't. There wasn't ten. Now, there's a connection between morality and unbelief. There's a question, there's a connection between theology and morality. And these people had involved themselves in the worst kind of immorality. These people were not only homosexuals, but they were homosexual rapists. And we like to think that if God did something really dramatic, then people would repent. Let me tell you something. God will send His message to anybody who will repent. God will send His mess messenger to anyone who, will, who is willing to repent. But the fact is that there are not many people who are willing to repent. We say, oh, if God would only appear, then I, then I would believe, or then they would believe. God appeared and lived here for 33 years, and He was murdered. He was murdered by people who knew that His claims were true. Well, what if God sent His angels to these wicked places? Wouldn't they repent? God did send His angels. And he could barely get the righteous people to come out. And when those heavenly messengers, it says two angels came to Sodom. So evidently the Lord himself did not go in. The third did not go in, but the two angels went in. And Sodom and Lot was sitting in the gate of Sodom. And when Lot saw those men, he knew who they were. And he bowed down. And he said to those men the same thing Abram, Abraham said to them. In, in Genesis 19.2, he says, Turn aside into your servant's house, spend the night, wash your feet, and then in the morning you can go on your way. And they say, no. We're going to spend the night outside. We're going to spend the night right in the middle of town, 
outside. And he uh, made dinner for them. But before the time came to go to sleep, the, uh, the men of the city had noticed those visitors. And probably they were very impressive physically. And the word had spread about these two men who were staying at Lot's house. So those men surrounded Lot's house, young men and old men from every part of the city. Lot went out to them, and he, he, he locked the door behind him. And he begged them in verse 7, not to act wickedly. Now here's a picture of a carnal man. He's always getting himself into trouble. And when he makes the appeal to sinful people like himself, they won't listen. He also tries, he also suggests the wrong way out of trouble. Now this is amazing. This is really amazing. He offers those men his daughters, his virgin daughters. That's, that's unimaginable. That shows you two things. First, it shows you how important it was to protect those visitors. And secondly, it shows you how screwed up Lot was, that he would offer his own daughters to men who were that wicked. And they said, we don't want your daughters. We want those men who are in your house. Get out of the way. Now, this is another thing about the carnal man. He thinks that he can influence other carnal people because he's been like them, but he can't. He has absolutely no, he's been living with them for years, but he has absolutely no influence with them at all. They said, get out of the way. And they rush the door, and they're ready to break down the door. But the men open the door, grab Lot, jerk him inside, shut the door, and they struck the men in the doorway with blindness. And then the heavenly visitors said, who you got in the house? Verse 12, the men said to Lot, whom else do you have here? And a son-in-law and your sons and your daughters, and whomever you have in this city, bring them out of this place, for we are about to destroy this place. The Lord has sent us to destroy this place. So, the man who was not able to influence his carnal neighbors now tries to influence his family. Lot went out and he spoke to his sons-in-law who were to marry his daughters and said, we got to get out of here. The Lord's going to destroy this place. They thought he was joking. They wouldn't listen to him. Now, here's the question. Does God send a messenger to tell those who are willing to repent? There were only four people in the city who were willing to leave. There was Lot, his wife, and two daughters. God sent two angels with two hands each. There were four people willing to leave. God sent four hands to lead four people out of the city. Verse 15, when morning dawned, the angels urged Lot, saying, Up, take your wife, your two daughters who are here, lest you be swept away in the punishment of the city. And then amazingly, verse 16, it says, He hesitated. Lot hesitated. One thing we're going to see in chapter 22 is the righteous man obeys immediately, even if it means sacrificing the most precious thing to him. The carnal man hesitates even if it means saving the most precious thing to him. 
They're trying to save his life. And he's not sure he wants to go. He's not sure he wants to be saved. So, here come the hands. Okay, look at verse 16. So the men grabbed their hands. They got his hand. See, this is where the hands come in. They seize his hand, the hand of his wife, and the hands of his daughters. For the compassion of the Lord was upon them. This is a great verse. The compassion of the Lord was upon him. And they brought him out and put him out of the city. Verse 17, it says that it came about when they had brought them outside that one said, one of the, the angels said, Escape for your life. Don't look behind you. Don't stay anywhere in the valley. Escape to the mountains lest you be swept away. Astoundingly, look at verse 18. Lot says, Oh no, lords. No, no, no. Let's don't do it that way. In verse 16, he hesitates. In verse 18, he he defies them. He says, no, let's do it another way. Let's be saved in my way, not your way. We have a saying in English. It's a Christian saying. You can say, Lord, and you can say, no, but you can't say, no, Lord. If he's your Lord, you can't tell him no. And if you tell him no, He's not your Lord. You got it? But Lot does. Lot says, oh, no, my lords. He says, uh, you know, I can't go all the way up there. Let me just stop here. Let me just stop a, a little way out of the way that my life might be saved. And... They said, okay, do it your way. But something terrible happens there. Um, it says that the Lord rained fire and brimstone upon the cities of the plain, Sodom and Gomorrah, verse 24. It says in verse 25, He overthrew those cities, all, the, all of the valley, all the inhabitants of the cities, and what grew on the ground. This is the, this is the third, this is the fourth great judgment in the book of Genesis. There's the banishment from Eden and the curse on the ground and on the serpent. Um, there's the flood. There's the judgment at the Tower of Babel. And now there's the judgment on the cities of the plain. It's a much smaller judgment, but it's a judgment nonetheless. Then in verse 26 it says, but his wife looked back. Verse 17 says, don't look behind you. Verse 26 says, his wife looked back. Verse 17 says, don't look behind you. Verse 26 says, but she did look behind her. And we can be sure it wasn't merely a look of curiosity. It was a look of longing. It was, I don't want to be here. I want to be back there. That's my spiritual home. Sodom and Gomorrah, it's so hard to leave it. I don't want to go where the Lord takes me. I want to stay where I want to be. She never took another step. These are obviously dramatic and terrifying judgments. She became, it says in verse 26, a pillar of salt. She was judged. While we continue being a benevolent project, your kind donations will continue to be vital in fulfilling the calling of TVS ministry. We do count on your gracious support and cooperation. For detailed information, please visit tvsseminary.com. Verse 27 says, Abraham rose early in the morning and he went to the place where he'd stood before the Lord, and he looked down on the place he'd been praying for. He looked down toward Sodom and Gomorrah and toward all the land of the valley, and, he, and behold, he looked and saw that the smoke of the land ascended like the smoke of a furnace. 
came about when God destroyed the cities of the valley that God remembered Abraham and sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow which he overthrew the cities in which Lot lived. In other words, God answered Abraham's prayer. Now, we've already seen some terrible things. We've seen two cities destroyed. We've seen a woman judged, executed, killed in a remarkable way. Now we see something that's also terrible. It's very much like what happened in um, after the flood between Noah and his son Ham. It involved drunkenness. It involved an act of incest. While the Iron Curtain was up during the communist era, I was at the Budapest airport. And I started talking to a man at the airport from Syria. And he had on some very unusual shoes, and I told him that I liked his shoes. And he told me where he bought the shoes. And we began to talk, and I began to witness to him. He was from Damascus. He was a Muslim. And the more I witnessed to him, the more details he went into about how he could never be a Christian. He said he could never be a Christian because he could never believe the Bible. And he said he could never believe the Bible because it wasn't true, that it couldn't be true. And he only gave me one example. And the example he gave me was these verses that we're about to look at. He said, no man could have ever done that. And I thought, wow, of all the things in the Bible to resist faith upon, he certainly chose an unusual subject. But he could not believe that Lot, a man like Lot, could ever do something like this. Well, in the first place, they got him drunk, okay? And in the second place, he wasn't a righteous man. And in the third place, he wasn't where he was supposed to be. He went out of the city, yes, but he didn't go far enough. He was willing to get far enough away that he wouldn't be burned up. But he wasn't willing to go far enough away where he would be in a place of righteousness, the righteous place where God wanted him to go. Now isn't that a picture of what so many people are looking for when it comes to salvation? Isn't it true that we don't want to go to hell, but we're not sure we want to go to heaven either? We certainly don't want to go to hell. We don't want to be in the place where we are punished for our sins, but we also don't necessarily want to be in a place where we can't sin, which is the kind of place that heaven is. Do you know that C.S. Lewis suggests that the doors of hell may be locked on the inside? What did he mean by that? He meant that it could be that people could leave hell if they wanted to, but maybe they don't want to. Now, if the alternative was a condominium in San Diego or Palm Beach, everyone would leave hell. But that's not the alternative. The alternative is heaven. Christopher Hitchens, one of the most famous atheists in the world, says that living in heaven would be living like, would be like living in North Korea. So he blasphemy, com blasphemously compares the God of the Bible to the dictator of North Korea. And basically what Christopher Hitchens is saying is if there is a heaven, I don't want to go there. It's interesting that the, the rich man in hell in Luke 16, I toured the monastery near here yesterday and there's a great mural depicting that scene in Luke, Luke 16 of the, of the rich man and Lazarus and Lazarus in hell. It's very interesting that the rich man in hell does not ask to be released. He asks to be visited. He asks to be relieved but not released. 
Well, I'm not saying whether that's true or not true. I'm just saying that it's an interesting thought that C.S. Lewis had. But the, the reality is that Lot did not want to go to the place of safety. He just wanted to go to the place where he didn't get burned. He didn't want to go to the place of spiritual safety. He wanted to go to the place of physical safety. And in that place, his daughters say in verse 32, Let's get our father drunk. Let us have relations with him so that we may preserve our family through our father. The desire on the part of women to have children was so great that they would do something this terrible. They had just seen their world swept away. They would just seen their fiance swept away. They would just seen their hopes of marriage swept away. But they think, whether we can have a husband or not, we've got to have children. And there's only one man here that we have access to. So we're going to use that man in that way to have children. It's a disgusting thought. It's a terrible thought. But it happened. And it happened two nights in a row. And they both conceived. Verse 36. Verse 37 says, The firstborn bore a son, and called his name Moab. He is the father of the Moabites to this day. Verse 38 says, and For the younger she also bore a son and called his name Ben-Ami. Father, Ben-Ami means father of his people. Moab means son of the father. 